growing weary of running from room to room, practicing one-tooth insurance-driven dentistry? Then stay tuned for the latest episode of The Lionhearted, where Dr. Steven Rasner will hand you the blueprint for what many call the gold standard of general practice dentistry. Hi, everyone. Dr. Steve Rasner here, and welcome to The Lionhearted Podcast. I like to keep these in real time. And so we're in mid-February right now, the both of us. And let me just get right to it. First, let me say thank you to a recent bunch of new followers in Ireland. Appreciate that, guys. And all of you who tune in weekly and share the information that I'm offering you. So just two weeks ago, I posted a podcast called The $44,000 Tuesday because I collected that amount of money on a Tuesday. And when I talked about that, it was a little uncomfortable for me because the lion-hearted dentist's philosophy is not how much you can gross. That's not at all why I talk about these protocols. And it's not even about how much you net. Honestly, to me, it's like, you know, in sports, you always hear the old timers say, you play the game right, you do the right thing. That's very much how I feel about the philosophies I share with you in terms of how you should approach your dental practice. And to be quite honest with you, the extraordinary production and income is a byproduct. It's an outcome that goes with doing dentistry the right way. And so if I was uncomfortable with that, why would I post this one two weeks later that's called The $66,000 Wednesday. Well, for one thing, it happened. And, you know, to be frank with you, if you do the kind of numbers that you've heard me allude to, it doesn't happen every week, but it happens a lot. These kind of gigantic days that, that are shaped around the gross and net income that You've heard me refer to that, again, I I have to say this, that is a byproduct of doing things, in my opinion, the right way. What would be the wrong way? Well, you know, first of all, that's not fair for me to say that. What would be the wrong way for me is to have multiple, multiple practices of which I have no control over the quality of care, over my representation of my name. By doing that kind of organization, I would have these amazing numbers. Uh, No, that's not what I'm after. So the takeaway when I have this kind of podcast, and another reason I'm, so why, why am I having this podcast so soon after the last one? Well, the last one was one of the most downloaded podcasts that I've produced in the last year. So somebody's interested in how that happens. And I don't blame you. It astounds me. Trust me. I think you can tell if you've watched me before that I'm authentic. So when I get to the end of a day and I usually have a sense of how that day went. And, you know, I always know my numbers at the end of the day. I'm not obsessed with it, but I I know my numbers. I know what kind of work I did. I know what cases I started. I know who came in for consults that day or recently. So naturally, I I have a pulse on that. But when I'm told those kind of days, especially when it far exceeds what I thought, yeah, I'm astounded myself. So what I want to do with this podcast, the $66,000 Wednesday, is break it down. How did it happen? What happened and what didn't happen? 
You know, and by the way, I, I think it's fair for me to say that that during these last couple of years, there's been weeks where I told you I had a horrific week, whether it was a business horrific week with no case acceptance or just a bad organizational week. So you're damn right, I'm going to share with you. It's important for me. If you knew me personally, I never get too high on the good stuff in life. I probably should breathe that more, but I don't. So it's not, if you think this is bragging, then you don't know who I am. No, this is about, wow, if that can happen, because think about it for a minute. I realize those numbers are gigantic. And so let's break it down. You must be wondering if you don't know, like, well, how did that happen? Is that three offices? Is No, it's majorly one office. In fact, on that particular day, my auxiliary office collected and produced, you know, I don't know what they produced, but they collected like less than $3,000. So if you wanted to hold a fire to me, it would be called the $63,000 Wednesday. Still pretty good. Just in case you're wondering, I have seven ops. On that day, I had two hygienists. Nothing came out of hygiene significantly that day. That day was really the reflection and the outcome, and I'm going to be specific in a second, of two patients that had come in earlier in the last week or two. One said they were definitely coming in and one needed to think about things. And they were both north of $25,000 cases. And they were both surgical cases. And they were both implant-related cases. And I want to say something to you. Because I was doing four mil collections 15 years ago when I did significantly less implant dentistry than I do today. And, and even if you did a fraction of what I just said, this is an important point. And you don't have to kill yourself. And this was not about seeing 15 patients, a lot of patients, not at all. In fact, I have the schedule right in front of me. You know, I saw five patients that day, three major patients, meaning two and a half hour appointments. And I'm going to delve into this a little bit. Most of the other stuff was side appointments, okay? I had two hygiene schedules, as I alluded to. Lion-hearted dentist way is never about how much crown and bridge I can do each day and how fast you can prep and how many patients you can get in and out. And by the way, I have practiced that way. And I am here with you. Those of you in dental school, those of you starting out, trying to save you time, save you heartache and frustration by listening to where I am at over a 40-year career. So on probably anything you hear me say is a reflection of the fact I did it differently earlier in my career because I didn't know any better. And I realize this brings up a number of questions for you. And that's why I'm doing it, because you got to break down. And, and you don't have to reinvent and get to this point next year. But if you have a goal in mind, as opposed to just going in the perhaps wrong direction for years, wouldn't that benefit you? I think it would. I don't know how many years I practiced and was impressed if I did 20 units of Crown and Bridge in one day. I mean, I never went home and thought, oh, that's tiring me out or how fulfilling is that? Certainly, I guess there's days I do do that still. But, you know, we had more goals back then and stuff than I do now. You know, my goal is now what my goal for you would be. And you're going to hate this, but it would be to be a great, great dentist. What's that mean? That you really connect with the people that end up in your office, talking about patients. That you really give an amazing new patient examination from oral cancer screening to muscle palpation to 
studying the five areas that you hear me allude to on many other podcasts early in my podcast career, if you go back, there's multiple, multiple podcasts dedicated to that. And if you do that, not just that, because we've talked about a lot of things on this program. We've talked about having a staff that's engaged, that understands making people feel value. Well, does your staff do that or not? Do you even look at that? Look, I am, especially in the last couple of years with COVID, I don't know what's going on in your office. I don't know how extreme this may sound to you, these concepts I'm giving you. To me, they're not extreme at all. Why wouldn't a business probably do well if it made its clients, in our case, patients, feel value, feel special, feel that it's worth going out and network to go to Rasner or you because it feels different. What feels different? You're on time. You're greeted in a spotlessly clean place. I don't have waterfalls in my waiting room. Remember that. I think my office is very attractive. My other office in Bridgeton is completely mom and pop. It does a million a year on its own, by the way. Very mom and pop. Nothing fancy about it. I'm sure many of your offices are much more decorated and invested in than that office is. And so I think it's important to be spotlessly clean. I don't think you have to have marble and expensive art. In fact, I wouldn't do that. So I've always been pretty in tuned, I think, to the community with which I practice. And I think that our environment that the patients walk into reflects that. And I don't think there's ever a time, no matter where you're at, that you could justify a mediocre or worse looking, dismal, bad lighting, okay, clean maybe, environment that patients walk into. I walked into that with a new physician appointment I had one year ago and I never went back. It was a classic thing you hear me tell you not to do. He made me wait. New patient appointment. It was 7 o'clock at night. I waited 45 minutes. There was nobody else in the waiting room for them to take me back. The lighting looked like I was at a motor vehicle, a motor vehicle office, a government state-run office. The lighting was wretched. The radio was wretched. It looked like it hadn't been painted in five years. This is a internist. That was highly recommended. I don't know how it happened. It doesn't matter. I I think I'm making a point that this happens. So I know I got off track here, but the point I think I'm trying to hammer you on is it's everything. That's how the 66K day happens because it's everything from, by the way, those two patients that committed that day to large treatment plans, the way they didn't feel pressured by me when they did come in earlier, the way they were greeted for the first time, think about it for a minute. They picked up a telephone at some point. I didn't know these two patients. They'd never been in my office. They picked up a telephone based on what? I'm tying this all in for you guys. Based on branding. You hear me talk about branding all the time. Well, branding is marketing. My branding is very consistent. It is what you hear me tell you. By the way, not many of you take me up on these offers. And it's work for me to do it. Not a lot of work, but I got to remember to do it. And I'll send you one of my radio ads. Go back to the marketing podcast that we've done. It's about trust and confidence. Those of you listening right now, who doesn't want on any level of businesses that you require in your life, your banking institution, the person you take your pets to, your, I don't know, your your lawyer, your, your teachers, if you don't trust them, if you're not sure they're competent, or if they're very competent, but the, you know, that you don't feel that, They really know who you are or 
care who you are. I had lung cancer in 2009. Bad. And I got treated at an unbelievably reputable institution, the University of Pennsylvania. But I didn't go there for my chemo. Right? The place that did my surgery very well, I didn't go there for the chemo. Because during the process of being explained what chemo was going to be like, or my options, and our battle plan, I had a distinct feeling. They didn't know me from the last five people that were in there more, that morning. So I went to another university. You don't think that could, if that could possibly happen with people that, especially that we're trying to get people to go out of network. I don't want you to be in network right away. I mean, eventually, excuse me, eventually. Because it's, you can't practice and take the time required to produce excellent outcomes and make a living off what insurance provides for you. It's, it's just dreadful. So there's so many factors that go into this that end up resulting in this extraordinary Wednesday of which, as I said earlier in this podcast, there's many Wednesdays. They may not be 66, but they're, or Thursdays or Mondays. You know, you don't need too many of those each week to have just a giant week. And you know what's even better? What's better is that I feel more than ever with the principles I share in the last two years with you that these patients aren't begrudgingly going through care. I don't want those patients to seek treatment that I offer them if this is going to be the house they bought that was too big or the car they bought that they bought on ether and now they regret it. I don't want that. And I, I have probably have had that, and maybe so of you, in my career before for sure. You know, somebody who comes in, they want a smile makeover, and they need a smile makeover. What they don't know, maybe in their head, they're thinking it's 4000 But in our head, it's three times that or more. And you were so good or I was so good that they went for it. And now they're, that's a bad situation. And, and I deal with that now too. So you couldn't have caught me at a better time. So let me just back it up. This day was not a bunch of patients flowing in and out. And, you know, it is rare for me to see more than three new patients in one given day. And to be honest with you, it's probably rare for me to see more than six new patients in a given week. Now, there's a reason for that because we screen our patients. And if you go back to the podcast that talks about screening, you'll know why. I mean, I can't give it all in this one today. What this is is a recapitulation of a lot of the things that we talked about that add up to any, and it's, you're damn right, man, it's nice going home on Wednesday and going back to work on Thursday and, and having people really appreciate the process. I'm talking about the patients. So I want to be more specific, as I said to you, I would be about these couple cases. One patient that came in was a 51-year-old. And as I tell you about these cases, I want you to try to remember all the things that I'm going to tell you how it's connected to the Lionhearted Principles. So this patient came in. He's 51. You hear me? I said he's 51. And had not been to a dentist in years. Had fear. Remember, that's the other thing that I market. So I market trust and confidence. And I clearly market no-cost sedation, which in my case means oral sedation, a cocktail that most of you are very familiar with at this point, and nitrous oxide as well, as long as that's all indicated with the patient's medical history. And it almost always is. 
So patients know this about us because I think it's on my website, which is pearlsmiles.com, pearlsmiles.com. I have a beautiful electric sign. Probably sounds tacky, but it's not. It's beautiful. It provides the weather. It's well done. It was very expensive. My practice is adjacent to a major road. So it's not the kind of road where people go 20 miles an hour. So I wanted something to be clear and easy for them to see. And if they see nothing else, they know it's a dental office and they know it's no cost sedation. And again, I've expounded on this many times in other podcasts. But this patient comes in with his mom. Think about that for a minute. So his mom is in her mid-70s. And that happened because he knew he needed a lot of work. He knew that we wanted a somebody in his life, which in this particular patient's case wasn't a significant other, it was his mom. And we want them there. Now, in this case, obviously, there was a unspoken connection that maybe she would be helping him financially. Quite honestly, the treatment plan was he had three lower posterior teeth and just a horrific removable partial denture that had broken. So he had... Uh, a second molar on one side, a second premolar, and a molar, and that's all the abutments he had. I want you to picture this. This patient goes through all these channels. The new patient screening with Michelle, who is just amazing. By the way, one of you, and I really appreciate it, uh, suggested that I bring her on the show. So she's the one that does the finances. She walks in that room when I'm done. And that's an art as well. But I set that up and you need to set that up. What that means is I give a tremendously thorough presentation that usually makes this patient want this work. And I leave it with this. I say, listen, the next thing that's going to happen is Michelle. Now remember, Michelle not only took their initial phone call, she had a one-to-one -one private five-minute or less interview in the room with them when they got to the office. And I've talked about that on other podcasts. There's a reason for everything I do. And the reason for that, real quickly, is a lot of people don't tell you full disclosure over the telephone when they first call you. And this is a second opportunity for them to tell you what's really bothering them or what they really need or what they really want. And so this patient sits standing, sitting in front of me, had all that. And then I come in. You know, he needed treatment on his maxillary arch, nothing significant. But on the lower arch, of course I'm gonna recommend three implants and a bar retained partial. In this case, I am actually maintaining his posterior teeth and adding to him where he doesn't have teeth from first molar on the right side all the way to the second molar on the left. I'm sorry, he has a second bicuspid. He has number 29. Those of you in, in Europe, he that would be four, five. That's his last tooth on the right. On the left, he has three, seven. That's it. And of course I'm going to educate him that there's better alternatives. And I say it in a way that says, I say, listen, and I want you guys to hear this. I say, I am not here to sell you anything. I'm not here to talk you in anything. Here's what I'm here for. You're sitting in my chair, you're 51, you've worn a partial all these years. If that works for you and that's what you want again, as long as I think it won't damage you or the teeth you have left, then I will do that. But there's no way I'm not going to recommend a much better alternative for you that you will never regret. 
So he looked to me, I had a CBCT already. He looked like he had ample bone. And by the way, I'm going to tell you one more facet about interesting thing. And so his treatment plan was a, it turned out to be a four implant, bar retained partial denture, along with some maxillary work as well. And it was one of those two big cases that came back later. That was earlier in the week, and he had came in on that Wednesday to make the commitment. He had called us and said he wanted to come in and set up arrangements. I'm pretty sure that in this particular case, even though he was 51 years old, his parent helped him. He was not talked into anything. And when I explained it, as I've told you, I had models. I had, I had models of regular partials. I have multiple, multiple models in my office that are easy to get to. They're there in the room. The, the staff is trained because they screened him before I'm even in there. They're taking the x-rays, and they're aware also why he's there. He was there to replace his prostheses. And it's easy for them to get out what I need, and I expect them to have me ready. I don't expect to get up in the middle of my presentation and go to another room and start searching for relevant models. And these models are put in his hand, and the, the talk is slow, like you hear me speaking to you right now. And I got to tell you, it, it has never been better in terms of that approach. My case presentation, no pressure, just truth. And I want to give you a second one that was in on that day that was not part of that particular revenue because it's a different approach. It's a woman that came in who was 61, had eight upper teeth, eight lower teeth. And you ever have this happen to you? She wanted a maxillary and a mandibular denture. Her maxilla was shot. Her mandible, she had 22 through 27. Not in horrible condition, 23 through 26. The incisors had 50% bone loss, but I thought were manageable. And that was something I talked somebody into. I talked her out of a full lower denture, which I don't expect any hero worship from any of you from saying that to you. I'm just saying, yeah, because even as I'm speaking to her, her facial and her body language is like she really wanted a denture. And, you know, her mother had a denture. She had, quote unquote, a number of friends with lower dentures, and none of them complained. So what did I do? I brought out my model, my lower denture model, and my upper denture model. And I, I am unequivocal about saying lower dentures just don't work, unless you're okay with adhesive. And even if you're okay with adhesive, it is absolutely going to compromise your ability to chew food as you chew food right now. So is that something that you really want? You know, and before we're done, that console, you know, the conversation says, well, you're the dentist. I'm going to take your advice, which we all hear this. So it is our responsibility, is it not? I mean, all this falls under the title of education, which L.D. Pankey and many of our legends early in our industry said that was our responsibility of a complete dentist. Pete Dawson said it. So I didn't invent these principles. So again, on that particular day, clinically in my office, a number of post evals, I, I do want to share what I actually did that day. Uh, I did prep one patient for six teeth, sedated, made a mistake, meaning some patients, you hear me talk about sedation. You hear me gloat about sedation. Once in a blue moon, it makes some people nasty. And I don't have science on it because it doesn't happen very much. Like alcohol, alcohol can make some people nasty. And it's so low that I don't even have, I couldn't even tell you 
not to do. I would never tell you not to do it. And I just told you I'd made a mistake. I didn't see this. It's not, it's not that I made a mistake. I didn't see this patient who had always been so pleasant at why she was non-sedated to be like she was. She was outright nasty. Kind of ruined my day, to be honest with you. So that was a, a 10 to 12 patient, meaning 10 o'clock to 12, six preps, core buildups. I didn't do the provisionals because I never do. Really difficult, not a fun time. You know, I want to say one more thing to you. This is, I'm sorry if I'm carrying on too much this week, but so about a month ago, I was almost finished another young man who I had many sedated visits with that I absolutely made a mistake with him. I did not see in an interview. He was a bad candidate because he fought me through every visit. And that just does not happen. I need to be clear to you right now, well over nine out of 10 are perfect. They're just, they snore like a kitty cat. You're just so happy. You get your work done. Again, if you're new to my podcast, be sure to ask for the sedation protocol and we'll send it to you. It's free, of course. And I called up on my own because I was going to fire the patient, the one I'm talking about. I called up a local IV sedation guy and I explained the situation and he listened. And at the end, he said, but by the way, I got to tell you one more thing. Um, we don't work on them if they're not nice. And man, that really resonated with me. Because somewhere in my head, I felt the unspoken obligation to work on everybody. Like to be the hero dentist. And man, it wears you out. When people just aren't nice people being our patients, it just wrecks not that appointment, it wrecks you for a while. And that was this patient I was talking about. My next patient was a two-hour um, surgical patient. I grafted bone that you can learn at one of my courses in preparation for implants. So I removed teeth, prepared the arch with a titanium membrane, drew blood, we used platelet-rich plasma. Actually, we used platelet-rich fibrin. And that patient will be uncovered in four months. I gave myself two hours to do that. And the, other, the only other major patient I had that day was a root canal on tooth number 12. Which I'm going to leave you that story too. This is way too long of a podcast. But... So this is a patient that's come to me for 35 years. And he's one of those patients that's always looking for a break that somehow he slipped through all the cracks and he always got breaks. And he also somehow received dentistry that I never was quite proud of. Like I never got, I never had the opportunity to completely redo his mouth when I thought I needed to do it. And he's a Bruxer. And the net result, and this is important to leave you with this. Remember, you can learn from my mistakes. So why don't you picture this? He's got a bridge from 11 to 14, 11 and 12 uh, or abutments, 13 saponic, 14 the crown, the other abutment. And it comes out and everything's busted at the gingival margin. Good bone, no vertical room to restore him properly. And I'll tell you what I said to him. You know, and he comes in like it's my fault. By the way, complete documentation, which we should do on a different podcast, where I tried to restore him multiple times, including four years ago, that I patched him to back together. So he comes in and out of this bridge that I did in 2003 originally, is out. And we have no real teeth to put this on. And I said, you know what? If I just met you today, do you know what I would tell you in five minutes? That you need a, a complete rehab. I gave him a mirror. I said, bite down and look at those teeth. 
Look how much space is left to restore you. Do you understand why this is happening? And I'm not contentious with patients, but I kind of was with him. I said, this is the net result of not doing it the way I've been telling you I've been trying to do it for years. That's why we're here like this right now. That's why we're here. And now it's really a quagmire for you. It's really a problem. Because no matter what I do here, if I don't alter what dentists call the room, your vertical, we're going to have compromises. I don't know how long anything will last. And I don't know what the outcome is going to be of that, by the way. But I will tell, leave you with this. Because I'm thinking more than ever, because I'm doing these podcasts with you, the patients that will fail on you, the patients that will come back and fail the most, or the ones that you knew in your gut to begin with it was the wrong thing to do. And somehow, you did it anyway. Maybe because you felt obligated. Maybe you felt sorry for the patient because he had no financial alternative. I, I don't know why sometimes we do that. And they're always going to hold you accountable. You are so better never taking that case on if you can't really do it the way you want to do it. And I'm not talking everything's got to be implant retained. In this case, he should have had his, whatever he had left restored, opened up the vertical. You know, we would be talking about a very expensive case, which he had no intention of doing. Look, it's naive for you and I to sit here and not believe that there are patients, masses of patients out there who think insurance covers everything. If they do reach in their pocket, if it's $5,000, it's the moon. And yeah, that works for some patients, but for a host of other patients with bruxism, lost teeth, collapsed vertical, if you can't treat them the way you think you need to, you are way better off never starting the case. I, I know I talked pretty long this week. I'm sorry. Hope everybody had a good week, and I'll see you next week on The Lionhearted Dentist. Mail me at Dr. Rasner at AOL. See you then. Stay strong.